welcome everyone uh, to this great event today. I'm delighted to be here with you. And as you said, I, I, I work at Morgan Stanley. I actually work at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, uh, but I have had prior positions um, on both the sell side and the buy side. So I'm excited to hear the, the both perspectives today. And I think the common theme running through this conference really is all about uh, what I love most about my chosen profession, risk management, and it really has to do with change. So today we will look at the changing regulations. I'm sure there will be uh, some conversations around changing priorities of those, regula of those regulators, um, as well as changing products and similar products offered in different forms. Um, and then changing investing trends. So, uh, and then, uh, not, last but not least, the new tools, uh, which can help us cope with all of those changes, uh, all these changes. Uh, so, without further ado, I will introduce the panel um, today, which will cover um, counterparty risk and regulation, a sell side perspective. On my left, I have Gonzalo Garcia Kenny from Citigroup. He will be a moderator. Jason Hickey from Bank of America and Milton Brown uh, from UDS. So welcome to all of you. All right, my name is Gonzalo Garcia Kenny. I'm the head of the US Counterparty Optimization, Portfolio Optimization uh, Group. It's a CBAS um, structuring group for marketing offerings. Um, we're going to divide our uh, panel into uh, brief uh, topic for each one of the participants, the, the speakers, and then we're going to receive questions from, from the audience. Um, we're going to start then from Milton. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so just by way of background, you see my name on the board here. I work in the Risk Exposure Management Group at UDS, which is essentially a CBS. Uh, and the role has changed dramatically since the crisis. Uh, during, prior to the crisis, the CBA role was principally about managing counterparty risk, uh, depending upon which event you were at, how advanced you were, or where you were in terms of moving toward a mark to market framework, the CBA, that might, that might involve just simply taking a reserve on new business and holding it much like an actuarial reserve, or it might involve more of a risk management and hedging type approach, where you're actually marking that reserve to market and hedging with uh, credit derivative products, which is where everybody pretty much has migrated to today. So it was a simpler world. Trades were typically discounted at live or CBA reserves probably looked pretty similar across various uh, participants on the sell side. Uh, but since then, things have changed quite a bit. And while developments like uh, the clearing mandate uh, and the SEF trading have brought a little bit more, well, I should say a little bit, significantly more transparency and vanilla optimization to products, I would say, and the theme of my comments is going to be that they're still, and perhaps even we're further away from having a single price <coughs> in the market for any particular product. And I think that that's due to not just regulation, but changes in the market itself various people calculating things differently. Uh, people calculating the FPDA now, for example. I think most of the large banks in the industry have moved to, if not marking FPDA in their books, they've at least moved to pricing in the transactions. But there's really no agreement on the exact methodology that you use there. In terms of CSA differences, discounting based on CSA currencies, that varies across uh, dealers. I think everybody, again, is pretty much recognizing that conversion to CSA is important, that the cheapest to deliver collateral is important with regard to pricing, but people take a different approach to where they are and how sophisticated the products are. Uh, that's not regulatory, right? That's the basic difference. But on the regulatory side, I'd say even more so, there's probably <coughs> variation uh, both in terms of what individual country regulators are requiring people to do. Uh, for example, when it comes to CBA or RWA in the EU, uh, banks do have an exemption for certain end users, whereas in the US or in our country, Switzerland, we don't. Uh, there can be 
differences in terms of what model you're on, if you're on a standardized model versus an advanced model. So all of these things have created a, a kind of a market where people will not necessarily have the same price or the same transaction. And I think for the buy side, that's probably frustrating because it's not what you expect. It's not what you want either. Again, clearing and, uh, and electronic trading helps bring us back to that. But even with that, I think that because people are using different models and perhaps valuing capital differently, looking for different returns, even having different overhead costs, you're still going to see variation in price. Great. Now we move to uh, Jason Hickey. Give that some background about himself and also talk about the risk management perspective. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jason Hickey. I'm part of the Global Markets Risk Organization at uh, Bank of America. My principal responsibilities involve covering uh, the issuer risk for the uh, uh, debt securities portfolio across the credit spectrum, um, excluding Asia. I also have responsibility for the uh, structured credit businesses from a risk management standpoint globally. Um, and also have uh, market risk responsibilities for uh, our special situations and credit trading uh, areas. Um, in terms of in terms of the, um, the pending collateral rules as they pertain to some of the more complex credit derivatives that, that I deal with, I just wanted to touch upon some of the uh, implications that I think we're already seeing um, based upon some of the, uh, the regulations and implementation of central clearing um, and collateral uh, rules, but. Uh, but also what impact I'm going to have um, from, a, uh, from an issue risk perspective relative to any type of hedging activity that we want to um, deploy, whether it be in a, in a single security position or whether it be on a, a larger, more concentrated uh, issuer position within, within the bank. Um, from, from my perspective in general, and, and obviously I don't trade, I, I approve trades um, that are outside the norm or are complex. Um, what I see is that obviously things will become less bespoke. Um, and I think regulators, um, and I think to a certain extent the, uh, the credit crisis uh, complexity was, was part of the issue. And I think uh, clearly we're trying to work toward less complexity rather than more complexity. Um, and I think we already see less liquidity, there's already fewer dealers, um, and I think price behavior is, is very different now than it was uh, was some time ago. Um, collateral, um, clearly there will be more collateral, um, there already is, and there will be more um, in the future. Um, and I think, um, I think from a, a liquidity standpoint, as an, as an institution, as a regulated entity, there's just multiple impacts on a number of levels uh, from, a, from a net stable funding ratio standpoint, uh, the LCR ratio standpoint, large period of risk. You have this multiplicity of, of regulations that are that are brought to bear and, and uh, actually tend to reside in different silos uh, within the organization. And uh, I think it's, it's imperative that, uh, that, that people coordinate closely across those areas to make sure that the constraints are, are, are managed appropriately. Um, you know, I think that clearly there's there's less price transparency. I'll touch on that a little bit from a from a risk management standpoint. Um, and clearly, uh, uh, cost of funding is going to be uh, going to be higher for institutions uh, like ourselves, and uh, it already is for that. For that fact. If our cost of funding is higher, um, if we're going to do something synthetically, I think that's going to drive that, that cost higher as well, and, and perhaps impact returns in the uh, in the investor. In terms of in terms of pulling leverage, um, and obviously um, there will be less leverage in the system uh, going forward. So, from a from a risk management standpoint, um, again, I'll, I'll I'll try to be brief, but uh, again, a, a multiplicity of, of constraints. Um, I think, uh, um, and, and constituents for that matter, um, the, the bar has been raised. Regulatory standpoint, not only um, in the United States but uh, internationally. Um, so you have you have multiple constituents to deal with, more constituents than you've ever had in the past. Um, and 
that makes it very difficult to, to manage across jurisdictions or across the alignments. And um, uh, not only that, I think there's an increasing need for, for granularity um, because the, the types of types of data and the amount of data that we deal with at a trade level in, in global markets environment is, is staggering. Um, but but that's the uh, that's the expectation in order to uh, in order to be able to properly model the risk. Um, and clearly, if if um, someone is going to uh, be in a, a position where they where they wish to to model their collateral requirements, um, the effect, effectiveness of those models obviously is, is critical, uh, not only within certain asset classes but um, but across asset classes. And I think have become very siloed and that's somewhat problematic because I think it ignores diversification which is 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 that's part of why banks are involved in, in, in different activities. Um, so from a collateral standpoint some of this is analogous to the to the CCAR exercise which I'm involved in um, which um, introduces a, a whole new level of, of complexity um, when these rules um, go into effect. Um, in terms of I'll touch on a couple more things and then move on here, but uh, you know I think clearly there's there's regulatory arbitrage risk here, uh, and I think there are there are there are ways to provide funding or to provide derivative like products in other formats, um, but I think that has certain structural risks associated with it, with the inherent nature of the contracts, as well as regulatory risk um, if you're uh, involved in a strategy that. Uh, Achieves the same thing as a derivative, but maybe has a different capital treatment. So um, I think there's a need to be uh, very mindful of, of those circumstances and, and uh, consider them carefully um, if and when a regulator will to, to look at uh, look at that type of risk. Again, uh, I think it touched upon the uh, the model complexity, <coughs> which will uh, result in, in in collateral disputes. Quite frankly, and I think uh, given um, the netting sets, the, the, the amount of trades, the margin period of risk, collateral disputes, all these things tend to, to impact counterparty capital in a way they probably never have before. Um, and uh, to, to knit trades across legal entities, across lines of business, um, to model them in an efficient fashion is going to be a, a very significant challenge. It already is just from a, from a global market standpoint and an overall bank standpoint. Um, I think this is going to, some of the margin requirements are going to require some of the same activities um, in order to uh, in order to derive counterparty exposure in a, in a very, very complex environment. Um, and, and clearly, again, from a coordination standpoint, I think um, interacting with the front office operations, enterprise capital management, um, whatever regulatory uh, bodies you have, CDA, all of that has become a lot more complicated in the past today than it was in the past, which I think is is uh, interesting. But um, uh, I think there's there's clearly been a lot of change um, over time. I think generally risk management practices have gotten substantially better. I think we're better at calculating our exposures and our potential exposures and, and understanding where our where our gap risk lies. But I think there's also certain risks. In, in a concentrated dealer community where there may be less price transparency, there may be less liquidity, which gives rise to a different set of risks going forward. So. All right. So uh, we saw, uh, we discussed through Milton, the CBA perspective, how these new changes uh, are affecting and uh, how dealers, banks, are including that in the pricing, almost on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, Jason discussed how is our framework, how is our response from the mark, from the risk management perspective. And I'm going to give a little bit the the trading perspective and structure for topic. How uh, things have changed, where are we different and where are we not? Did we change a lot? And why is we have the idea that everything seems to be extremely uh, expensive? We have one of our colleagues from uh, clearing houses here. Explain a little bit better about that. Uh, as a background, uh, in 2009, uh, one, 
Latin Known Magazine conducted a survey among top banks, dealers across jurisdiction, the US and, and London actually, and asked what was the most significant event uh, for 2008. And I want to hear also from the audience, what do you think was the most significant event in 2008? 2007-2008, uh, when we have the rescue of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, we have TAR, uh, we have the acquisition of Bear Stearns with help by the government, by, by JP Morgan. But what do you think was the most significant event, a market event, in 2008? Anyone in the audience want to risk? We want to have your question, so. The survey came almost with 80% in agreement. The most significant event was the default of Lehman Brothers. And uh, right now, we have the idea that everything that we do, everything, every time that we trade, counterparty, is a very expensive thing. But there was obvious, obviously some flaws. And we have to be uh, looking at that inside ourselves and see uh, if we can criticize ourselves for how we were pricing things. Obviously, I would, say, I would say there were some mistakes or errors in the pricing of our risk. As uh, Jason and Newton put the example that now every time you trade with a counterparty, you have in your system how much additional charges you need to put in addition to your bid ask when you trade with a counterparty. So that changes from the front office on the trading side, changes the, our lives a lot. Uh, you are not going to make money as a trader by trading, uh, or a lot of money, by trading a lot of liquid products that have a bid ask that are very, very small. That becomes more of, more of a service. And uh, what you want to get from your buy side clients is maybe margin agreements, global margin agreements, or uh, CSAs that incentivize you to put with us big orders where we can make out our bid ask uh, spreads there. We can work it through time and uh, make money as dealers. There's another change of business that we are making money more now than before, which is our services. Uh, one significant service is that of clearing and brand brokerage. Because in order to get our counterparty exposure uh, compared to the past, where we have open trades with different counterparties in terms of derivatives, we may be going long, short with a certain counterparty and catching that with other one or selling that say protection or interface swap to someone else. Now we have to be very much concerned because if we have an open exposure with the camera party, CBA will charge us and we have to maintain a significant reserve. I'd rather have a probably that kind of party, that buy side client, traded with us and they went they bought protection on a name, they made money and then they wanted to sell back that protection at best level in the in the market work with some other dealer and have that open position with them. We know that We'd rather have both trades with us or away from us in order to reduce counterparty. That is something that is very much the importance of CBA desks in uh, financial institutions. Uh, as today. The, uh, I mentioned the, the clearing house and, and migration to the clearing house. Most of our trades, in terms of volume, are at clearing houses or moving into clearing houses. And regulatory pressure. Trades that are not moving in the immediate future to clearing houses uh, are going to have a mandatory minimum margin requirement. I'm not sure if people are familiar, but uh, many years ago, a few years ago, uh, Basel started with a consultation paper that eventually, in September last year, uh, transformed into a, a formal paper uh, or recommendation to be uh, adopted by each jurisdiction regarding margin requirement for non-centrally clear derivatives. So it gives uh, banks and dealers two options. One, you use a schedule, and trade by trade, you charge percentage over notion one. That is extremely punitive. ISA make a, made a, a, a good analysis that it would have a, a cost of eight trillion uh, from significant participants in the market. So that's something impossible. The second choice that Basel gave was can come up with a model that optimizes that margin, and that model needs to afford 
99% uh, confidence interval over 10 days, and a few other requirements. So each jurisdiction needed to validate and regulate more specifically those type of rules. We are in the process, we got together banks and significant participants and, and ISDA, and we are in the process right now of responding to the first recommendations issued by each uh, regulatory body. Japan issued something earlier this year. Uh, the European regulators issued uh, the specific regulatory uh, requirements in uh, April this year. Is already sent a consultation and we are waiting to, to hear back from them. And in the US, we have divided that divided into two prudential regulators on one hand, issued uh, a recommendation paper and then a consultation paper. We are supposed, the industry is going to respond shortly. Uh, we have until the 24th of this month. And non prudential regulators such as CFTC issued uh, their, their, their paper on the September 23rd, so we have 60 days from there as well. Um, so those specific uh, requirements are going to impact all of us. And that is something that we are prepared to for that. Uh, it's supposed to start December 2015. Uh, we are advocating for a postponement of a year and a half or so. Because we think that, uh, to be fair, regulators always offer two years after the rule is final to be implemented. And also because we believe, truly believe, that uh, the discussion with regulators in terms of getting the rules homogeneous across uh, jurisdictions will take some time. Uh, from, from now on, then, uh, we are open to questions from the, from the audience. And also we have some emails that we received before uh, we started. We already had questions. But let's start with the audience here first. Any question that we can answer? Uh, all the remarks were actually excellent. So, but I had one question just on, on the last uh, discussion about Lehman. I, mean, I, I understand that the biggest event in 08, when there were so many to choose from, that Lehman is a great one to choose since it has so many ramifications for all of what happened out there. But are, are you implying that counterparties and derivatives took large losses and that somehow? We're all dealing with counterparties differently now in derivatives. That's my question because my statement would be I mean, virtually all of Lehman's trades had CSAs. They all had collateral. <coughs> to the extent that a counterparty took losses, it's because there was a miscalculation of collateral or the market just moved so disruptively that the trades came down. Maybe both those were true. So my question would be what's different now? Have the calculation methods changed? I, I don't know. I don't know. Excellent question. Uh, I have my opinion, but we are all going to give us our viewpoint on different uh, well, uh, sure, I'll start off. Okay. Firstly, I, I would agree. I, I'd say that the, the two potential sources of losses would be if there was some mistake. I don't think that was a primary driver, frankly. Uh, although, when you're talking about products that are suddenly going from considered to be liquid to illiquid, there could be great price variation among where people think the value is, uh, but also the closeout period risk, right? And that was significant at that time. The market was moving very fast. Uh, I was not on the CDA desk, uh, probably thankfully at that time. I, I joined shortly after, but certainly got to, to witness some of the aftermath of uh, closing out of some of those positions. Uh, so you say, what's changed? Well, these initial margin rules will certainly be a change, right? So now initial margin is really in place to take care of closeout risk. It's, in this case, covering a 99-10 type of uh, tail that might or might not be enough, but it certainly will provide some extra resource there. Uh, I think just the capital rules in general are requiring banks to hold more capital. So events like this should become rarer. And when they do occur, they should be less systemically dangerous, in theory at least. Although I would say that there's still going to be a lot of correlation uh, among banks when this type of event uh, occurs, uh, which hopefully doesn't in the future. Uh, so I think that, that, you know, I don't want to hog up the time on this, but for me, the, I think your remarks are valid, but I do think that there's, there will be more resources and better discipline about, about risk management, about liquidity management, both because of the events that occurred, I think people will remember that and still have those scars, as well as some of the new rules and regulations. 
Sure, I'll, I'll make a couple of remarks. That, and from a risk standpoint, I was on a desk and watched it happen. And then I was also on a risk desk and watched the plan of reorganization go through and, and watch where the recoveries came up. So, so I, um, I don't, I don't have recoveries to cite by a legal entity and by contract, but uh, some of the recoveries were, were obviously substantial. But from a from a Lehman standpoint, what I would say is, in, in, in my opinion. Um, to a certain extent, is a leverage issue, um, and I think uh, it's a liquidity issue, and also a, a funding mismatch issue. So, um, and I think it was an extreme case of leverage, um, and perhaps um, a very fragile liquidity position, um, and perhaps the, you know the street had some of their independent amounts wrong, right? So, um, you know, if you were very aggressive on margining. Um, particularly for any kind of non-standard contract, um, you were the first to call, and you were the first to call aggressively, right? So, um, and I think uh, once that occurred, particularly when you're dealing with you know less liquid products, you know the price behavior changes, and I think that's some of the things we're talking about. So, um, in my view, those are some of the key events. Now, is this even the only reason for the financial crisis? No, but did it expose certain? Was it the one event that exposed certain elements that were, were wrong? Uh, probably yes. Yeah, I, I think I want to uh, to add to that. I, I, I agree. I I was one of the ones that responded. I was at the trading desk, and I thought that Lima was the, the most significant event there. Why it happened? Yeah, well, maybe it's leverage, as it was said. Why are we different now? I think the following. Imagine at the time of Lehman, uh, we have CT, uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and UBS. Right? And suppose that you are a client of us, uh, extremely credit for swaps, so you would maybe buy protection from us. Right? So you buy protection from me, and then I need to hedge, and if you want to end up flat at the end of the day, I buy from him. And then you, you end up your, your, your trade, whatever, your main money, and you hedge up or uh, tear up your trade with someone in the market at the best rate. What from UBS? We are facing each other many different times. Right now, we move a lot of that into facing only one kind of party, which is a clearing house. That, that solves a lot of the issues and the rumors at the time. You didn't know how, under the reports of a significant counterparty, what was the remaining trace or, or export, new exposure that that kind of party had. So maybe we thought. UBS has a significant exposure to something, or, or they may think that Citi was overexposed to something else because all their trade was with Lima. Now that problem is uh, mitigated to a certain extent because most of the products are in the clearing house. The second thing that is coming now is yes, you, we had collateral, but you mentioned in, independent amount. Across dealers, even today, we don't collect a lot, collect a lot of independent. We collect the variation margin, yes, we have the value of the trade. But to unwind the trade, it's not just the value of the trade today, but if it takes you a few days, that independent amount, that initial margin, or whatever it's called in different organizations, give you some extra cash and money to uh, weigh that volatility before the next few days. Models typically now accept 10 days. And this re new regulatory framework that I was referring to will force everybody to post initial margin for unclear trades among, your, among each other and in a third party custodial account. So I think that that also mitigates what was that. If there was, I, 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 and when we responded there, maybe we responded to what was an individual event. Maybe the root of the case was not the Lehman default, obviously, but we thought that that was a significant event that added. Can you comment on operational risk, where not only you are, even after the independent and the margin, you're also required to reserve capital for um, effectively 10 days of, uh, you know, I'll call it capital, if you will. Um, does that create a stress for you guys, or how do you price that in? So, Fred, where do you work? Uh... New York Capital. Look, I am on the front office, so obviously I, I don't have a complete torch of what is the operational uh, 
stress that we have, and I notice that it's a significant stress. Uh, I understand that the regulators now are demanding for all disputed amounts or unreconciled items to be afforded a, a reserve, to reserve some capital for that. Right? Uh, I'm not at the liberty to explain all, or to, to, to discuss all the projects that that group and, and ourselves as institutions are doing, but I would say the following. There are some ideas on, on, on having a some consortium type uh, group form to make sure that there's at least among the biggest uh, banks and dealers, which is included here in this panel, uh, we can have a centralized port, port rec process that will reduce uh, disputed uh, items. Uh, the other thing that I can say is that there's obviously in the market there are some uh, companies, maybe monopolies at this point, but there are a few, that run some, that optimizes portfolio. The one that I know is the Trioptima case. But uh, other than that, I don't I, I know. Can I just add the last comment is, is quite important. That uh, part of what's happened is that this has forced the industry to become much more disciplined in things like compression, both within the clearinghouse, by Optima to name one vendor, but there are several others out there, uh, and has actually reduced the amount of operational risk. But why is this happening? Because of the fact that there's a capital requirement against it. I would say that the operational risk RWAs, you know, for us, are probably right in the same neighborhood as the market risk or credit risk of it's, it's a significant drag, drag, probably not the right word, but it's a significant resource utilization. And it does need to find its way into pricing. I think you need to think about what you're pricing. If you're pricing the most vanilla, to be cleared interest rate swap, you're probably not gonna say that I need to charge a whole lot for operational risk, but if you're pricing something that is going to require new models, new infrastructure, what have you, Think you'd be foolish not to have some sort of a charge that is relative to the type of operational risk and potential RWA. Uh, I, would, I would add uh, just a couple things. I think, um, and I come come from it uh, from perhaps a, a slightly more bespoke structured standpoint, uh, where there still is an element of manual work from time to time, as much as we do not want there to be manual work. Um, if you want to provide a client solution, um, you know, that, that, that can find its way into, uh, into, the, uh, into the trading arrangement. And uh, I think to a certain extent, you have to automate or uh, have the ability to, to, to process that on a kind of a straight through basis, as they say. Um, but that's easier, easier said than done. So uh, clearly manual processes introduce the, the, the highest operational risk. Um, and obviously, you know, some of the other things that have been said about uh, netting set, you know, the, the size of, of the uh, complexity of the trading portfolio um, and the impacts that that could have on exposure and capital are all very material now. So, so um, particularly with a complex institution, it has to be a very, very uh, critical focus to get it, get it right. It has consequences. Quickly, this, are you considering regulatory capital um, solutions coming from the outside industry, if you will? Essentially, are there, you're seeing that uh, there, are, there are problems in this one, the audience that we are providing that kind of capital? For operational risk or in general? No, for the, essentially, the capital that's required for the way the OCC is or regulatory, essentially, whether you charge for it or not, and whether you manage it or not, you're still going to have to put up the capital for it. Right? I mean, it's, it's, you know, you're trying to minimize it, that's, that's fine, but, but this very prescriptive method of capturing the regulatory capital required against operational risk, which is you fail to call for 10 days. <coughs> Margin and, uh, and the dependent amount is part of that equation. So, are you alluding to uh, structures to lay off operational risk? 
sometimes insurance or, or uh, you know, I don't want to say cocoa, but you know, something along those lines, contingent payoff uh, structures. Because I think people have looked at that. I don't have a lot of personal experience with it. Don't know if our bank has done it or not. But I think that that's certainly something being discussed at a minimum. I think your challenge would be pricing it, right? Pricing it, make sure you get the recognition you want, right? I mean, for me, the price would probably be a function of the recognition. I know it is. Absolutely. That's not something I think we would enter into without our supervisors taking a good hard look and saying, yeah, this, this, this is a good purpose. So there are some, yeah, there are some uh, hedge funds in the market that offer that type of service, which would be very interesting. Uh, capital relief. Uh, whenever you want to reduce the counterparty risk for for yeah, for part counterparty, you obviously need to buy protection, right? Sort of protection, and maybe you can buy protection on a portfolio of names through CDS, or you can structure that through uh, the tranche of the CDO. And yes, uh, there is there in the market. Maybe on the buy side, uh, that could be explained if some of these funds do it. But uh, yes, there's a service uh, or, or, or product that is offered where that fund uh, sells uh, that protection to the financial institution that is needed. It's a bespoke tranche, and they would manage that through the standard index tranches. They hedge that. They take the basis on single names, or they hedge single names as required. Typically, are other financial institutions, so they trade in the CDS market. That that I've I've seen that it, it's in the market, uh, but there, there are not a lot of players, so maybe more players are needed. I, I agree. Yeah, I think I think Gonzalo makes a good point. There's one thing I'd add that I think it's different um, when you're hedging a position uh, that's held within the bank, whether it be a loan, a security, etc. Um, I, I, from seeing some more complex regulatory capital hedging type strategies, um, it's my general sense that. That, um, that the regulatory bodies are, are, are somewhat skeptical. Um, there have been a number of different strategies from a regulatory capital standpoint um, that were deployed with uh, perhaps smaller institutions. And I think, quite frankly, there was some concern around those types of trades that were targeted in, in that fashion. So, I mean, it's, it's, that's just a general sense that I have, but um, I think it's relevant uh, given what Gonzalo had to say on, on specific hedging. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kenny, um, just one quick question just to follow up. You were talking about you know having now uh, CCPs, you know, doing that as well as having all these kind of kind of parts. Um, what about all the saturation of uh, concentration risk now in CCPs that you may have going forward in terms of doing that? You know, they have to default uh, and recover from them. But you know, now you're going to go back to the same thing of having Yes, I, 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 agree, I agree with you. Now we are concentrated in certain clearing house, houses, right? And we're going to have our colleague from CME to expand on that. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll give my opinion. Uh, that is true. Uh, we are concentrating in big clearing houses rather than not be serious in too many. Uh, you have pros and cons. The pros is we instead of facing a lot of different counterparties, um, you know, listening to the rumors from the news defaulting and how much is impacting everyone else, now we're facing only one. The protocols are a little bit a lot clearer, <coughs> and while there's always a fight of who put more skin in the game, the clean help to the capital, the dealers put the more guarantee funds. Uh, that's an open discussion, but I think that there's a lot of layers there. From the start, uh, variation margin for the initial margin from participants, the guarantee fund from the dealers, the capital of sometimes it's part of the capital of the clearing uh, house. And you ask that question to my colleague here. And, uh, and then there's a more involvement from, from the industry. Uh, I think that then, yes, we are better off. But I hear, I hear you have a good point. Uh, are we considering big structures and should we be more diversified? It's, it's, a, it's a valid question. I'll, I'll 
just add one quick comment. I would say that um, from a central clearing party standpoint, I think it is the independent amount right? right? And from a, from a special credit standpoint, um, initial margin from, from, from my vantage point is what kind of saved us in the third crisis. Um, so now it's, it's becoming more systemic and implemented, which I think is interesting. But um, uh, it's getting the, uh, the independent amount correct, which is always a trend. Uh, I would say, uh, from my counterparty training, that uh, I think in an ideal world, there's one theory that helps that everybody that the trade gets to right? And if that happens, it doesn't look very risky because everything that goes out of this portfolio is the theory that was unfortunately that happens. Unfortunately, but that's just not reality, right? So, one of the things, one of the best things uh, that I think the industry can do now work with uh, the clearing houses and various third parties to try to rebalance risk among them and across clearing houses. I think that's a very simple thing to do. It just takes getting everybody on the same page and importing Not necessarily importing trade, but you, you can offset the risk by just trading from one, one clearing house to the other. So you're, you're doing a pair of trades that in and of themselves are perfectly offsetting and have no risk to you from a trading desk stamp. They shift the risk around where it belongs. And we're starting to see solutions emerge from the clearing houses and the, and the third parties. I think that's, that's very promising. Uh, we take one of the emails. Okay. Uh, this is for the panel in general. Uh, how did uh, Dot Frank and new regulations impact you personally? Uh, yeah, I think it's the full point of that. <laughs> you want to get personal? <laughs> uh, I hope so. Uh, but uh, from a professional standpoint, uh, I think it, it has made the role of my team more valuable. I think in my early remarks, I talked about how we were credit risk managers within you know, within the trading world, managing CDA. Uh, now it's much more than that. We're really basically leading the front office in terms of what price things. We're helping the front office figure out what is optimal in terms of reshaping counterparty portfolios or backloading and gearing in a, in a way that's efficient both for us and our clients. Uh, so for me, I, I know it's not been the greatest development maybe for the industry, you know, in terms of the, the top line or bottom line as a whole, but for me it's been very exciting and it's actually opened up a lot of different avenues and it's brought, what I like about it too, it's brought a lot of discipline that was lacking pre-crisis to the management of these portfolios, making sure that economic profit is paramount, not just top line revenue, and making sure that, that risk is appropriate. I, I would agree. I think there's a there's a degree of regulatory expertise here in terms of being able to tie together um, you know, trade impact on RWA, trade impact on stress bar, um, some of the counterparty issues that we, we discussed. So there's just, as I, as I indicated, there's just far more binding constraints and to the extent that you understand the, the regulatory regime and the impacts of certain types of trades and, and where uh, capital might move um, in a particular circumstance or um, based upon a certain trading strategy, I think you can add a, a tremendous amount of value and uh, be much more integrated with the business from a risk standpoint. Um, and uh, the regulatory oversight is, is much keener. Um, it's, uh, uh, I would say it's, uh, how can I put this delicately? I think, I think it's the, the level of scrutiny and intelligence and sophistication has continued to, to improve. Um, and uh, there's always a higher bar from a, from a reporting standpoint than from a risk framework standpoint. So um, and those are all, all positives. I agree with my colleagues. Uh, how this impacted the front office? I would say there's some business that we don't do anymore, uh, proprietary trading, for instance. There's some products that we don't trade anymore, uh, and there's some others that became more liquid. Uh, liquid in the in the sense of we, we discussed uh, operational discrepancy, but discrepancy discrepancies in general. Everything that we clear, we have one single settlement price. And some of the market data vendors that used to be uh, not, not that accurate in the past, I mean, I mentioned 
market partners or, 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 or some others. Now the prices <laughs> are, are used for uh, the financial division to, to double check prices are, are, are much better for many products, even if they're not clear. Uh, so those things are the most relevant impacting Thank you to Quantify and our chairman. I think that uh, if there's any other question, we will take it. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're done.